Now this morning, once again, we're going straight to the word, the purpose-driven life. I can as well say the purpose-driven man, amen, but the purpose-driven life, amen, as applies to you, you can say I'm the purpose-driven woman or the purpose-driven man. That is what I've teamed it this morning on the impact series. Consider the purpose-driven life. Philippians 3 verse 10 to 14. That I may know him, Philippians 3, verse 10 to 14, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, I move, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Hallelujah. Please, I forgot. Amen. I say, I'll finish this, then I'll do something quickly. Brethren, I did not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I will continue. Now, the purpose-driven life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word, your scriptures. Lord, we pray that your word will do us good this morning. That your word will heal the sick, set captives free, deliver the oppressed, save souls, transform lives. That your word will be a blessing unto us. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Now, the purpose-driven life. Every one of us is driven by something. We do what we do. We are where, where we are because of something. Every one of us is driven by there's something that woke you up this morning. You were driven by something that you must go to church. Maybe your, 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 maybe your belief that, has, that every Sunday you must be in the house of God. Am I right? You were driven by something. You were, every one of us, we are driven by something. And you are in Bradford being driven by something. A desire for education for the students. Am I right? You were driven by that desire. Hallelujah. Desire for a good life, a better life. Every one of us, we are driven by something. My life, for me, was driven by a pursuit for knowledge. I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more and to know more. And that kept, you know, was the driving force to where I am today. As a child of God, was, I was driven by a passion for Christ. I wanted to know more about this God, like Paul, that I may know him. And that gradually, uh, by grace of God, uh, was the force behind taking me to becoming a pastor. Hallelujah. All I wanted was just to be like any other believer. Sit down, come to church, work for God, and that's it. But... With that desire of doing things for God, knowing more about God, just being, just want to know more. And every one of us is driven by something. Your life is driven by something. For some, you are driven by success. You want to succeed. You don't want to fail. So you work hard. You are working hard. You are working hard. You are reading. You are studying. You are in business. You want to succeed. You are driven by that passion to succeed. Every one of us is driven by something. For some, they want to speak out. They want to be the voice, the voiceless. For some, they want to serve. They want to represent people, the politicians. They want to make life better for someone else. So what is driving your life? What is driving your life? What is the driven purpose behind your life for who, for you? Is it fear? You are afraid to fail your family. Therefore, you have that inner force that is taking you 
you know, paying the price, sacrificing life? Is it fear? Is it anger? Is it regret? Is it remorse? Is it ambition? The desire to please men or to please God, is that the force behind you moving ahead in life? Or is it an accumulation of possessions? You want to have everything. Buy this house, get this house, this, that, and that, that. You want to have children. Every one of us is driven by something. Rick Warren, the writer of the book, the author of the book, The Purpose Driven Life. And it became so popular because he identified five main, five main purposes that God intends to be a driving force for our lives. In all his books, The Purpose Driven Life, The Purpose Driven Man, The Purpose Driven Church, and all that and all that, it became a world acclaimed hotter. In summary, he identified five things. Number one, that we as a people, for every human being, believers, we were planned for God's pleasure. We were created for God's pleasure. The purpose-driven life, the purpose-driven man, woman, you are created for God's pleasure. To know him and to love him. To know him and to what? Love him, Matthew. Meet at him, walk with me quickly. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Hallelujah. To know him and to love him. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Continue on, 38. This is the first and great commandment, 39. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, 30, 40 now. On these two commandments and all the law and the prophets. So he identified number one, we were planned to our God's pleasure to know him and to love him. Paul writing, we saw that in the Philippians 3.10. To know him, that I may know him. Number two. So number one, we were planned, we were created for God's pleasure. To know him and to love him. Number two, we were formed for God's family. We were formed for God's family to find a, ho a home and a family. John 1 verse 12. John 1 verse 12. We were formed. John 1 verse 12. We were formed for God's family. We were formed to find a home. This is your home. This is the family. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Part of God's family. To those who believe in his name, you and I, part of God's children, part of God's family, we were formed. The purpose-driven man is part of God's family. The purpose-driven life is a life that is you no know, linked to God's family. Number three, number three, we were created to become like Christ. That is the, all his writing, Rick Warren. The third point, summary of all his books is that we were created to become like Christ with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit. We were created, what? To become like Christ. Christ, number four. We were shaped for serving God. We were shaped. You were, God formed you to serve him. Your height, your voice, your color, everything you are, you are shaped to serve God. Hallelujah. And to serve God with your talent, with your skill, with passion. First Corinthians 15, 58. First Corinthians 15, 58. You were shaped to serve him. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. 
you were shaped to serve God. You can have Matthew 6.24 and Mark 10.45. Mark 10.45, that's okay. Mark 10.45. Hallelujah. Mark 10.45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be saved, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Even Jesus came to serve. We were formed, shaped to serve God. Even Jesus came to serve. Thank God for the healing. Thank God for the loving. He came to serve you and I. Hallelujah. If he saved, then we too will serve. Number five of the entirety of Rick Warren's writings is that we were made for a mission. Made for a mission to introduce other people to God's to God's five purposes for their lives. We were made for a mission, a mission to introduce other people to God. Simple. You were made to be an ambassador of Christ on earth. Not just to be saved, not just to serve, but to save others, to showcase Jesus to others. That is why you are made. That is the purpose-driven life. Anything outside of this, your life has no purpose. As a believer, if any one of this is taken out of your life, then you are walking in error. I just want to be a child of God, and that is it. It's me and me alone. No, you've been saved for you to save others, to introduce God to others. He, do, he will do the saving, but you are to showcase Jesus to others. You must be doing that consciously, intent as part of your life tasks, obligations, and responsibilities. You can't neglect it. You are the light of the world, salt to the head. Ambassador, showcasing others, introducing them to Jesus. So, among the many, the father figure is sacrificial. It's giving, serving, caring, all embracing, is loving, is a disciplinarian, is courageous, is a home manager, is a God lover, is an early riser. You can go on and on. Is a pastor, is a protector, is a provider. Psalm 103, verse 13. As a father has compassion, Psalm 103, verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Hallelujah. Most times I think back you know, and I appreciate God for the father, earthly father that God gave to me, and later my spiritual fathers. That even from afar, my spiritual father, even from afar, I remember the first time I thought, I came to Bradford and I thought of marriage. I was calling my spiritual father at about 2 a.m. in the night. <laughs> Amen. The more I get, I, I thought of it, the more I pick up the phone and I start calling, waking up somebody at 2, 3 a.m. Because I don't want to make the mistake. As the thoughts were coming, so before I make a move the next morning, let me talk to my spiritual father first. And I didn't, there was no like, there was no like uh, protocols or whatever. What's the word here? No decency. Is that the word? <laughs> I just caught somebody, a pastor, sleeping, snoring, waking him up by 3 a.m. because one of your children is somewhere thinking about how to marry. But here we are. All things just go. So, Brother Hapo, what's up this morning, this, this morning? So, Pastor, this is, this, this is it. Okay, this and that and that and that. Maybe, okay, let's talk tomorrow. For me, I, I, did, I forgot that someone is snoring, someone is sleeping. But it was to me, later I said, it was a good thing. If I had not called, I would have messed up with wrong decisions. Amen. 2 Samuel 7, 14 to 15. 2 Samuel 7, 14 to 15. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, 
I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Mm. Are you seeing that? With what? With floggings. I'm preaching the Bible. Don't be too much right humanly. Now, are you seeing it there? I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he, con co if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of man. Not the rod of God, the rod of man. I know man's rod. Physical rod. I will chasten him with the rod of man and with the blows of the sons of man. A great man of God began to do that. Um, Cravadola, you know, <laughs> he did that. Am I right? He did that, and the whole world was talking. And someone said, one of our, our father said, they say, I love him. Say, I love that. <laughs> that is the way to go. When someone cannot, when, when you, your children doesn't want to, when they don't want to hear serious things, serious things that are life, you know, you, you've seen life, and they don't want to hear, you, there's a time for sit down there. I will not bury you. Amen. There's time for you to hold the person down. There's a place, I mean, when we're working with children, there's a place of uh, martial heart. You know, the, the trainers have to curtail people, hold the person down the, until the police comes. Amen? So you may as well say you were holding the person down while the police was coming. Amen? Quickly, let's go. So with that, a God-given purpose to shape our life, we become driven by destructive influences. For we are all motivated by something. So now here are three of the most common forces that drive people. Three things that drive people. Number one, people are driven by guilt and fear. People are, guilt, are driven by guilt and fear. They are guilty. Guilty conscious, guilty conscious, fear. Cal I mean, if you go to Galatians, Galatians 5.13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. For you, you've been called to liberty. D only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. You God has not given the spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1.7. But a power of love and of a sound mind. Isaiah 44 verse 2. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you? He will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jethron, whom I have chosen. Isaiah 26 verse 3, he says, For you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. People do things because of fear. No. You have the liberty of God, the child of God. He has not given you the spirit of fear. Amen. People are driven by fear. I'm afraid what will happen to me. Therefore, let me do it my own way. Let me do it this way. People are driven by guilt and fear. I'm already pregnant. Let me get married. To him. Amen. No. No. Don't be driven by that. So don't even get to that extent. Number two, people are driven by anger and resentment. Anger. He did this to me. She did this to me. Therefore, I will do this. Therefore, I will do, display this way. No. Don't be driven by that. Be a child of God. Hallelujah. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. People are driven by hunger. The purpose-driven life. Why are people doing what they are doing? Everyone is driven by something. So when you see somebody manifesting or doing something, it's driven by something. Maybe hunger, resentment, guilt, fear. Proverbs 14, 29 says, people will, people will un, with understanding, people with understanding control their hunger. 
people with understanding, they control what? Their anger. A odd temper shows great foolishness. Are you odd tempered? Is a sign or is an indication of great what? Foolishness. It didn't say foolishness. Great what? Foolishness. Judgment is of God. Ezekiel 25, 17. I will, Ezekiel 25, 17, I will execute great vengeance on them with furious rebukes and they shall know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. Vengeance is of God. Don't be too angry. And don't allow anger to make you to take decisions. I always say it and I'll say it again. Don't take a permanent decision based on temporary circumstances. Are you with me? Don't take a permanent decision based on temporary what? Life may be hard now. Life will not be hard forever. Amen? There will be good times and better times are still ahead of you. Second Corinthians 4 verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. Don't live your life based on what you see just around today. Oh, this is it. And therefore, every, every, every choice, every decision is based on what? What about the things that are yet to come? Hallelujah. Amen. Psalm 37 verse 8 says, Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. Anger will lead to evil. That's the NIV. The NLT now says, Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. Number three. So number one, people are driven by guilt and fear. Number two, people are driven by anger and resentment. Number three, people are driven by wealth and materialism. They want to gain half the whole world. They want to have all the money in the world. Just one person wants to have all the billions. That's why you see some rulers amazing all, amazing all the wealth. Wealth that is meant for everybody in the country. One person will just everything. Everything. And they keep piling, corrupt. First John 2, verse 15, 17 says, Do not love the world or the things of, in the world. First John 2, 15, 17. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it but he who does the will of God abides forever. Hallelujah. People want to have, amass the whole world, the wealth, everything, everything grabbable, they grab it. Whether they have to kill, they kill. And we see that in some parts of the world. People are driven by what? Wealth, materialism. But here is the promise, third John 2, beloved, Third John 2, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in hell just as your soul prospers. Therefore, know that there is a promise for you. Isaiah 3 verse 10. Say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. Amen. And they will eat the food of their doing. There's a promise of abundance for you. So why are you grabbing everything, just yourself, you, you, and you? Alone. So back to our main text, then we round it up. Our main text, Philippians 3, verse 10 to 4. The Passion Translation. Philippians 3, 10 to 14. The Passion Translation. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. I will be one with him in his sufferings and become like him in his death. Only then will I be able to experience complete oneness with him in his resurrection from the realm of death. Twelve, I admit that 
I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into its abundance so that I may reach the purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me to make me his own. 13, I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. 14, I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. Hallelujah. So Paul is saying, thank God for all the materialism. Thank God for the passion for knowledge. Thank God for everything, but I'm all out for Jesus. My focus is on what? Jesus. So three things from this, summarily then, from this, and we are done. Three lessons are from Paul's writing here. He said that the father figure is a role model. The purpose-driven life is a role model. Compassionate is a God-pleaser. So Paul said that I may know him. Philippians 3 verse 10 we read. Psalm 103 verse 13. It says, as a father is, has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Amen. As a role model, you must demonstrate a passion of a passion for knowledge. To know, a passion to know. Increase your knowledge about God. Paul said that I may know him. So increase your knowledge about what? God. Increase your knowledge of what you do, about what you do for a living. Increase your knowledge. Increase your knowledge in your area of challenge, what you don't know. And you like to do. Don't you see how beautiful it was our, 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 our sister, Melody, on the drums this morning? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. She, I mean, she saw the young man drumming, and you no, know, she was. I, I saw her some, some Sundays ago, some two, three months ago. She would stay back and you know, call the drummer, please come and teach me. And she would be drumming with the drummer. Amen. And the time came as I heard the, the Kinola encouraging them. When the person turned around, step in. God works with availability. Amen. And she stepped in yesterday, and today she's drumming, and there was no difference. We praise God, we worship God. No pain. Amen. No complaint. No, no complaint. No complaint. For others, they will complain all over the place. No, life move. We move. Amen. Increase your. So when I see complaint all over the, if all I hear is complaint, I begin to look at the person. Complain, come every day. Complain, come on. Move. Get the thing done. As the situation comes that way, walk your way out of it. Walk, walk your way through it. Hallelujah. So increase your knowledge of what you are. We do for a living, your knowledge in your area of challenge. Be humble enough to learn from those who know more than you. Know that it takes humility to be instructed. Learn from the masters. Hallelujah. I learn from all kinds of people. Learn from experts. Seek to learn from those who have proofs. Do not look for a man who slaps his wife to teach you about marriage. Amen. Do not look for a woman that insults her husband to teach her about how to keep a husband. Learn from the what? The masters. Those with proofs. Are you still with me? A passion to appreciate. You must have a passion to appreciate the wonders of God. Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Psalm 105, verse 5 says, remember the Lord for his marvelous works, his wonders that he has done. Hallelujah. Not just appreciate his wonders, but also demonstrate his wonders as a man, as a believer, not just thank God for his wonders, but also what? 
demonstrate his wonders. Demonstrate his wonders. Mark 16, 17, 18 says, and these signs will follow those who believe, not just men, every one of us, those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Demonstrate his wonders. Amen. I remember when we were in the U.S. We were in our workplace. My boss came to me one day. I put lay hands on me. You have healing hands. And I ran from, the, from my decks back because my workplace, my flat was attached to the, to, the, to the office, you know, sort of. It was a children's home. Flat. So when she said that, I ran to, because Andrew was in the, in her flat. And I said, the boss came, our director came and said, I should lay hands on her. And Pastor Andrew said, Oni, I thought you were a man. The woman said, lay hands on me and you are running away from, from your workplace to, to, the, to the house. So all this that you do, all this that you do, you can't, your boss, because she's the director. She said, lay hands on me, and then you are running away from me. So I became angry at the more, if there's a word. I became what? Angrier, more angry. <laughs> I came home to, to, to be consoled, and, she, and my wife is driving me hard to go, go and lay hands on your boss. <laughs> because I fasted for the job. There was a house attached to the job. I have a house. My bills are paid for. I work 10 days at a stretch, and 10 days I have, my food is paid for. I have an official car. I have a private car. I have the company, a company credit card. I can, when I'm on duty, I can use the credit card. Amen. I mean that kind of job. And I should lay hands on my boss, and somebody will now begin to use that as, you know, and maybe the boss will be assaulted all over the place, and and people will say this African man is doing something here. I said, no, 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 no. This is not what I began for. I came to work and make some money. <laughs> Amen. So I ran, so I ran, so I ran. I moved. <laughs> so I came home and my wife is saying, move, go back. <laughs> so I moved back. So I prepared myself. I know when she will come back to, the, to, my, to my work area, you know, when she will come for supervision. And I prepared myself. This is a boy that I've invited to my church. He's a prophet. I invited to my uh, parish. To come, and, you know, to come and minister. And she has a prophetic dance group. So that kind of person I'm talking about, not just an unbeliever, she's a believer. She said, I know that you have healing hands. That's a word, a statement. Therefore, lay hands on me. I have this particular issue. I don't, I, I mean, she didn't mention it. I have an issue. Lay hands on me. I know you have healing hands. So I ran. I got home my wife, and my wife said, go back. So I prepared myself. The next time she came, I said, man, come, please, bring your head. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Because I couldn't sleep at home now. Amen. <laughs> well, every time I, anything I, before I could lay hands on her, she would say, go and lay hands on your boss first. <laughs> so she came, I did that, and lay hands on her, prayed for her. That was the place whereby my first Sunday at work, the first Sunday at work, the first at work, I was working on a Sunday. I said, no. It's a Christian establishment. Why must I be going to a beach with children on a Sunday morning? And I said, I'm not going to the beach with the children. So my colleagues, colleagues said, she, my colleagues phoned the boss. This is my boss, the, our director. I said, this new staff, we're supposed to go to the beach, Miami Beach, with, with the children for something, something, something. And he said he's not going because it's, it's, it's a Sunday. He must go to church. You know some stubborn staff? Me, just a novice, an African rugged believer. I'm in a Christian establishment. It's a Sunday. I must go to church. And they said they are going to the beach. So I said, I'm not going. The boss was there, two bosses. And my colleagues now phoned the boss that employed me. <laughs> this young man is something else. Come and take this to a new, employ- new staff. So they called the boss. The boss said, he said he wants church. Tell him to start church. Hallelujah. I said, everybody stand up, praise and worship. Amen. 
in life, you get what you demand for. Life doesn't give you what you, what you qualify for. You must ask for it. So he said, ah, it needs aqua. Then start church then. Ah, I said, thank God. Everybody, let's have service. Praise and worship. Minister the word. Lay hands on people. Cast out demons. Save souls. As we were done, we entered the bus. We went. We moved. Amen. And from that day, the whole establishment, this one is not just an ordinary believer. We are all believers here, but this one is different. Things were happening in one section of the, of the campus. I'm done now. I'm going, I have three points, but I'm on one. We'll, we'll conclude here. Things were happening. There were some, there was, there was some huh? funny behavior. I'm putting it the right way. Funny behavior. It's a female, female hostels. Staff and, staff and, and the clients were having some affairs. So the boss called me, called myself and Pastor Andra. Okay, when the children have gone to school, go and pray over that building. So when the children have gone to school, the staff, they were all there, and we picked my anointing oil, went there, anointed have all the rooms of the children, all the rooms, all the desks, everywhere, everywhere. They were funny behavior, if you know what I mean. Staff and children, female hostel, they were having some Plus, plus, minus, minus, like signs. <laughs> like attract, like. Funny behavior. So we'll finish that anointing service. We had anointed the whole everywhere, bathrooms everywhere, wherever they were doing funny things. But it, it didn't take long. They started exposing themselves. So this staff, female staff, this is having an affair with female staff, that. Female, female client, this. And the whole place was sanitized. Hallelujah. Why did the boss call on me? Because you've known who I am. This one will sanitize this place. Hallelujah. Quickly, as we get this thing done in next one, two minutes. So, what did I say? Number one, the father figure is a role model. is a God pleaser. Number two, experience his love. Have a passion to experience his love and express the power of God. Paul, Paul was writing that the most potent moral force in life is the love of a father. The love of a father, not the love of all these young men and women. The love of the father is the most potent. When the father says, I love you, it, takes a, it, it goes deep into that child. Thank God for mothers. But when the father says, I love you, no, it enters, it gives some Great strength on that child. The most potent moral force in life is the love of a father. Fathers show love to their children. Just like God loves us, we are required to demonstrate that love. God loved us, the father, God the father. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the most potent force is that fathers, we must love our children. Pastor Andrea posted something yesterday evening. We were walking throughout the church, doing the grass, everything throughout yesterday. By the time I got home, I thought I would run into the football. I love football. Amen. Somebody was playing the 10 minutes, the 10 minutes of Portugal and um, Germany. Portugal and Germany. Am I right? 4-2. All right, I thank God for all this, uh, my cool football <laughs> lovers. Amen. For two. And I said, let me finish the last 10 minutes. I got 10 minutes. And it is said, Daddy, you promised me, let's go to the park. I said, come on. First, I'm tired. And now I want to watch 10 minutes of this last match. And now you said I must go to the park. I said, okay, give me 10 minutes. I thought he would forget. <laughs> he went and looked at the clock, sat down and looked at the clock. He's going... Five minutes left, <laughs> 44 minutes left. I said, it's not your time. It's the time of the, <laughs> on the screen. They put extra minutes. Am I right? Extra four minutes, there about, there about. I said, it's extra, another four minutes. Look at the time here. Look at it, not, not your time. And we finished, we moved to the park. And he was so happy. The father's love, sacrificial. Number three, number three now, then I'm, you no know, first, 
John 4, 8, you can say that he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We can continue from that. Okay, number, finally, number three, you are a work in progress. Know that you are a work in progress. You are not all it. You have a fault. Every one of us, someone came to us and said, every one of us, we have issues. Every one of us, we are all what? Works in progress. So that father may not be the fullness of what you think a man should be. It's still a work in progress. Just like you too, you are a work in progress. So, beer. Proverbs 4, 18 says, For, but the part of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter onto the perfect day. Ever. It's moving towards perfection. We are all works in progress. They may not be, there may not be a perfect father, I would say, if you allow me. There may not be what? A perfect father. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians 3, 18, my last scripture, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. From glory we are growing. Let's rise up, church. Hallelujah. Clap, clap for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. From glory to glory, rise up. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians 3, verse 18. Just bless the name of Jesus. Just appreciate God for a day like this, the purpose-driven life. Just thank God for who God has made you to be. Just appreciate him that we, we have an heavenly father. Remember, if you know this song, I have a father, almighty father, who is king of kings and lord of lords. I have a father. Again, come on. I have a father. Come on. Almighty. Yes. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. I have a father. So, Father, we thank you for a day like this. You've set aside as, we've set aside as a people to celebrate our earthly biological fathers, those that are still around and those that have gone past the glory, and to celebrate you as our heavenly father. Lord, for every man here, for every person, individual here, Lord, I pray that you give to us a purpose for our living in the mighty name of Jesus, that we will live a life of purpose, that we will not live life zigzagness no zigzagly if that's the word this year you've said earlier in the year that you know there shall be no more zigzagging is a word there shall be no more zigzagging that means we will not live life anyhow rather we will live life with a purpose intentional give us that grace lord thank you lord for all fathers and potential fathers the fullness of your Glory, let it be made manifest in all our lives, in all our families. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. With all eyes closed, as we, as, we, as we conclude this morning, I want to usher some to become real children of God. You are here, you are still one leg here and one leg out there. You are not sure of your purpose of being called a child of God. You are not a born again child of God. Why not pray this prayer with me this right now? Say, Father, I come to you as a son, as a daughter. And I know I'm a sinner. I confess of all my sins. Cleanse all my sins away with your precious blood. Write my name in the book of life. I accept you, Lord, as my Lord, Master, and Savior. And from this day, Lord, give me the grace to walk with you as your true child. You pray that prayer, you are a child of God. Please get across to us and uh, we will walk with you. Shout glory. glory. Amen. Amen. Clap, clap for Jesus. Amen.